I'm sure this has happened to you. You've written a scene for your novel or your memoir, and you revised it three, four, five times, and still you're not satisfied with that scene. There's something that's just not right. I'm Scott Butwell. I'm writing a memoir, and this happens to me all the time. Scenes are the backbone of writing a memoir or a novel, and I don't know why I do this, but when I get to the climax, I always make the number one mistake that you shouldn't make. And this is, I fail to flesh out the climax by really describing what happens at this key moment of a scene. And this is bad because it robs readers of being able to see the most crucial part of your scene. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you a simple strategy that I use and you can use to improve the climax part of your scenes. This is a scene from my memoir, Quick Backstory. My wife criticized me for buying our son Super Diaper Baby from Dave Pilkey. Then the next week, she went to Target, bought three Captain Underpants books, and they came home, and later that night, they were reading Captain Underpants for a bedtime story. This is the ultimate test of whether Lisa has changed. She has laughed with him reading Captain Underpants, but I think for sure she will say, you remember the deal. We read one chapter from a Captain Underpants book and one chapter from your devotional. I think this is a decent climax. It has some good details about what happens at this key moment of the scene. What I've noticed about the scenes that I write, when it comes to the climax, I give some details, but often I could give a lot more details, kind of a blow-by-blow -blow description to really show what happens at this key moment of a scene. The scene just needs some details to really flesh out the climax moment, maybe some dialogue, uh, so the reader can see what happened at the key moment of the scene. I want to share with you a really good example of a climax in a scene from Sean Smucker's memoir, How to Use a Runaway Truck Ramp. Pay attention to how much blow-by-blow -blow detail he gives at this key moment of his scene. He had pulled away from the scenic view at the top of Tayton Pass, breathless, anxious, eager to have the four-mile descent behind us. It wasn't long before I had realized we would be fortunate to make this stretch without incident. Even in first gear, I had to use my brakes too often, too hard. The air pressure dropped. The brakes smelled hot after just half a mile. I pulled into a side pull-off area to give the bus a rest. My parking brake barely engaged. Adrenaline left me feeling shaky. I opened the bus door. The cold air felt great. And behind us, the mountainside was covered in snow, but both were contrasted by the smell of hot brakes. The smell of something important not going well. After 10 minutes or so, I released the brake and began creeping forward. The brakes felt okay, but not quite right. I had no idea what to do, but then I saw another pull-off a few hundred yards ahead. I decided to pull in there and park for an hour, let the brakes cool completely. We might take all day getting down, oh well. By now, May Lee and the three older kids sat just behind me. Sam napped in the back. The kids chattered on and on about the view, the trees, the bears they wanted to see. It was surreal. Inside, I felt a massive sense of tension nearing panic. Yet just behind me, the kids were having a great trip. They had no idea. But May Lee, I could tell she knew what was going on. She asked me short questions in a quiet voice as we crept along at five miles per hour. Questions that I had no answer for. Are we okay? Can you stop? Should we pull off? I pulled our 20,000 pounds into the next pull-off, preparing to stop, put on the parking brake, and wait until the brakes cooled. But it was at that moment I realized we couldn't stop, at least not completely. I pushed the brake all the way to the floor, but we kept coasting. A snail's pace, really. It's amazing how immense fear can rise up in the face of such slow movement. In a last-ditch effort, I pulled on the parking brake, but it did nothing. We kept coasting forward. This is when we began gaining speed, and I reached over with my other foot, 
put both feet on the brake and pushed down as hard as I could. This is when I realized we could not stop. A guardrail defined the next curve to the left, just a hundred yards or so ahead of us. Beyond that road, a thousand feet of air and rock and evergreens. Faster, soon we were going 15 miles per hour. We came around the turn. I began calculating at what point I would need to wreck the bus into the side of the mountain. The brakes no longer slowed us at all. Then we saw it. On the left, a runaway truck ramp. The kind I used to always look at and think, seriously, people actually use those? I think Sean Smucker, you would agree, did a great job on the climax part of that scene. He really made you feel like you were right there in the RV with his family as they are going down Tayton Pass in Wyoming with no brakes. He really gives a blow-by-blow -blow description to make you really feel and see what he's going through at that key moment. So the strategy that you can use to improve the climax part of your scene is show, not tell. Try to appeal with the five senses to really allow the reader to see exactly what your characters are going through at this key moment of a climax. As always, I want to thank you for watching this video. And if you found it useful to your own writing, don't forget to click subscribe so you can be notified when I make new videos. Happy writing, everybody.